what you guys generally think about the reading? Overall, like, dislike, impartial? It was a little confusing. A little confusing. That's fair. Well, I'll try to um, clar clarify for you. All right. So I think we're all back. Let me kind of provide some context as to who we're dealing with, and then I'll get into some of my notes and things I found of interest in the reading. Uh, turn miles down a little bit. All right. Um, So the author is Ngugi Wathiango. Um, he's out of Kenya. He's a Kenyan born intellectual author. Um, and he actually teaches at the University of uh, California, Irvine. So he's not too far from, from us here. Um, so he's accessible. And that's one of the rare things when you have um, authors that you read and you have the opportunity to reach out to them, you know, it's rare, but I, I definitely en encourage it. Um, and, and nine times out of 10, they're more willing to, you know, they're willing to kind of respond back to you and establish dialogue. Um, but he's another one of these um, African African intellectuals who were trained, right, in European universities, just like we um, talked about last week with Maladoma Patrice Somme, same situation, right? But they take this university, um, European university training and really problematize a lot of the notions that they were pre presented in their educational training. Um, so that's in Googie. Uh, the book that you read is entitled um, Decolonizing the Mind, right? And so for me, one of the first things that stood out was how he opens up the text, right? And, and he, he makes the claim that this is the last time that he'll be dealing with the English language, right? So from now on, he'll no longer be talking in, in, in English and he'll be dealing with his native dialect, the um, Kukuyu. So um, I found that of great interest, right? And then he also talks about this notion of this book being part of a continuing dialogue and a larger issue um, that's going on among, among Africa as it pertains to Africa's destiny, right? So this notion of decolonization, this notion of, um, this notion of language, right? And, and what language to use is part of a longer, larger conversation that's developing throughout Africa as it pertains to Africa's destiny. Um, what else? And then he also no notions that, uh, he makes this notion that United States led imperialism presents an ultimatum of, or, of theft, right? Or, or death. So those are the ultimatum that the United States imperialism presents. And for me, it made me think about this text. I, I forget the author's name, but the, the book is titled Diaries of Economic Hitmen. And essentially the thesis of the book is this individual would fly to all these so-called third world countries, uh, meet with the leaders of these third world countries, tell them that, you know, I need to establish a contract with your oil fields, right? So sign over your oil rights to me or catch this bullet, you'll face assassination or you'll face a coup d'etat, right? So this is what Ngugi's talking about when he says US imperialism presents the ultimatum of death, so stealing your actual resources, right? Or death, right? Coup d'etat or assassination. So I found that of interest. Um, and then he talks about the affect of the cultural bomb, right? And that's also on page three. Um, I'll, I'm gonna read the passage and I'll kind of provide an explanation. The oppressed and the exploited of the earth maintain their defiance, liberty from the theft, right? Talking about that, what we were talking about earlier, the theft or the death, right? They want liberty from that paradigm. But the biggest weapon wielded and actually daily unleashed by imperialism against the collective defiance is the cultural bomb. The effect of a cultural bomb is to annihilate a people's belief in their names, their languages, in their environment, in their heritage of struggle, in their unity, in their capacities, and ultimately in themselves, right? So that's the effect of the cultural bomb. I'm gonna read it one more time. The effect of a cultural bomb is to, annihil is to annihilate a people's belief in their names, in their languages, in their environments, in their heritage of struggle, in their unity, 
in their capacities and ultimately in themselves, right? So that's what the cultural bomb does. So I, I believe I mentioned earlier in this course that the vestiges of enslavement were three things, right? Your name, your language, and your religion, right? That's exactly what Ngugi is talking about when he mentions this cultural bomb, right? So it makes you want to disassociate with those things, right? So this is what the culture, that's what the cultural bomb is, right? It makes them see their past as one wasteland of non-achievement. It makes them want to distance, makes them want to distance themselves from that wasteland. It makes them want to identify with that which is furthest removed from themselves. For instance, with other people's languages rather than their own. Um, so another way to think about this, right? And, and I believe we had this conversation before uh, talking about code switching, right? And I believe we talked about that in this class. That's, that's an effect of the cultural bomb, right? You wanna distance yourself from things that you um, feel that is not, not worthy to be viewed as, as acceptable, right? Um, for my dual language speakers, for my bilingual individuals, right? Maybe you have, experience times where they tell you not to speak your native language. These areas are not appropriate for you to speak these languages, right? That's an effect of the cultural bomb. It makes you not see the value in your customs, in your traditions, in your cultures, right? Identifying more so with those of typically your oppressor. Now, what Ngugi is gonna deal with in particular is the cultural bomb as it pertains to language. This is the, this is the problem that he, he seeks to deal with, okay? Um, so, and then he makes the move on page four, and this is where he starts the, um, the actual chapter, right? And we're going to go towards the, the middle of page four, towards the end of the opening paragraph, um, starting with the sentence that says the choice. The choice of language and the use to which language is put is central to a people's definition of themselves in relation to their natural and social environment. One more time. The choice of language and the use to which language is put is central to a people's definition of themselves in relation to their natural and social environment. Okay? Indeed, in relation to the entire universe, right? So their language identifies how they relate to themselves, how they relate to their environments, and how they relate to the universe, okay? This is how important for Ngugi language is. Hence, language has always been at the heart of the two contending social forces in the Africa of the 20th century. So this notion of the two contending social forces, think back to last week's reading, right? Maladoma also talks about the two contending social forces for Africa, right? His native land, the culture and the society of the Dagara, right? And then the society that he was forced to befriend, right? Those are those two warring social forces. So the same thing that Ngugi is talking about, right? Um, do you want to use European languages? Do you want to identify with Europe? Or do you want to use African languages and identify with your native self, right? These are the two competing social forces. Um, he mentions also in the following paragraph, the contention Right, so this idea between the two different worlds that Maladoma is talking about, and in this context, and Googie's talking about language, right? The contention started around 100 years ago when in 1884, the capitalist powers of Europe sat in Berlin and carved an entire continent with a multiplicity of peoples, cultures, languages into different colonies. Um, has anyone heard of, or have we discussed in this course, the Berlin Conference of 1884? Does that sound familiar at all? No? No. Okay. So the Berlin Conference of, 19, of 1884, excuse me, is when the European powers came together, they met in Berlin, and they decided what European country would take over what part of Africa, okay? So... Um, the, French said, the French said, I'll take over Senegal and these other parts of Africa, Cote d'Ivoire, right? Um, the Belgium said, we'll take the Congo, right? And they divided up the entire African continent and said that these portions of Africa will be my territory. 
Now, mind you, no Africans were invited to this conference. No Africans had any say so as to how this would all go down. The European powers came together and decided this. This would be the equivalent of all the powerful people in Beverly Hills coming together and saying, okay, we're gonna take over East LA and I'm gonna take this part of Boyle Heights. I'm gonna take this part of uh, Alhambra and they're determining how the area of East LA will work. They're gonna take all of the resources of East LA, right? They're gonna people, they're gonna put the people of East LA to work for them, right? This Berlin conference was how colonization was organized, right? This is how they put the, the idea of colonization into play was at this conference. So this is what Ngugi is saying, the contention started at that conference, okay? Um, Okay, and then so on page six, we have the um, the problem of the conference of African um, writers of English expression, and I'm going to read the opening paragraph on page six. A, the title, a conference of African writers of English expression, automatically excluded those who wrote in African languages. Now on, looking back from the self-questioning heights of 1986, I can see this contained a absurd abnormality. What, what do you think he means by the self-questioning heights of, of 1986, right? So obviously this, this was, um, the conference happened in the 70s, right? So there's a time gap. So he's looking back to what happened 10 years ago, roughly, right? So um, has anybody heard of the term hindsight's 2020? Does that sound familiar? No? Okay. What is 2020 vision? What does it mean when you have 2020 vision? Like perfect vision, clear vision. You have perfect vision, exactly. So when they're saying that hindsight would happen in the past is 2020 because it already happened, right? You know how everything's going to play out. Right. If I asked you about what happened yesterday, you could tell me how everything went down with more or less perfect detail. Right. That's why hindsight is 2020. So when Ngugi is saying, now looking back at this conference that happened 10 years ago, I could see kind of where, where shit was messed up. Right. I could see the falsities that took place in that conference. Right. That's why he says the self questioning heights. Right. He's elevated in his ability to self critique actions of the past. Right. He sees that the conference contained absurd abnormalities. I, a student, could qualify for the meeting on the basis of only two published short stories, the fig tree in a student journal and the return in a new journal, transition, okay? So he's saying, I'm a student. I only have two short stories published, right? So, but I could attend this conference. But neither Saban Robert then the greatest living East African poet with several works of poetry and prose to his credit in Kiswahili, nor Chief Faguna, the great Nigerian writer with several published titles in Yoruba could possibly qualify. So what is he saying? What's the problem? What's the abnormality that at play within this conference of African writers of English expression? Um, it seems like they have, they prefer the writings in English or like, um, like a, a European, you know, Absolutely. language. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And what he's saying is, right, he's a student. So that's like um, one of y'all writing a poem or writing a short story and it gets published in the student journal, right? And that allows you to attend the conference because you wrote this story in English, right? But I'm a professor. I'm the most famous poet in the world, right? But when I write, I write in African languages. I write in Tedenya, right? So he's saying, how is it that someone of my recognition as a professor, and I'm, I'm the most recognized poet in the world, is not able to attend this conference, but students with just two small publications and student journals are able to attend the conference, right? He's saying that there's a contradiction at play. Right. And again, he's circling this notion of, of, of language, right? It's at the heart of his argument. Um, 
And then this on page nine, I think he he really yeah, we'll go to page nine. Um, I think he really lays out his argument here. Two points. So on the middle of page nine, second paragraph, we'll start there. How did we arrive at this acceptance of the fatalistic logic of the unsaleable position of English in our literature? What does fatalistic logic mean? Fatalistic logic. So logic, I think you have a pretty good understanding of what logic means, but what does fatalistic mean? What does fatal mean? Like something terrible. Something terrible. Um, death, right? Something that causes death. That's, that's what fatal means. So when they're saying a fatalistic logic, right? Something that you think is um, as assured as death, right? Death is inevitable. Everyone's going to face death, right? So they're saying that how do we get to the point to where we think the position of the English language is the foremost language, right? It's, as, it's, it's, a, it's position as being the best language is as sure as death is sure, right? So he's questioning, how do we as African thinkers and writers get to this position, okay? Um, the face, fatalistic logic of the unsaleable position of English in our literature, in our culture, in, in our politics, right? So not only our literature, but our culture and our politics, right? What was the route from the Berlin of 1884? Again, we talked about that Berlin conference. It's the same phenomenon he's talking about via the Marchieri of 1962. Now that Marchieri, that's the university, right? That's the university that Ngugi attended, okay? So he's saying the same powers that were in play at the Berlin conference are the same powers at play that run the university, okay? So they're the ones that help me to instill this fatalistic logic that English is a superior language, okay? Um, to what is still prevailing, it's what is still the prevailing and dominant logic 100 years later. How did we as African writers come to be so feeble towards the claims of our language on us and so aggressive in our claims on other languages, particularly the languages of our colonization, right? So how do we get to the point as African writers to where we're willing to defend and promote a language that colonized us, right? But we're not willing to, um, to defend and support and produce in our own native language. Right, this is the problem for Ngugi, right? This is the central problem for Ngugi, right? And then to me, the way that he ends this essay or this um, chapter is exquisite. Like, I, I mean, he says it all in the final paragraph. In my view, language was the most important vehicle through which power fascinated and, and held the soul prisoner. One more time. In my view, language was the most important vehicle through which that power fascinated and held the soul prisoner. The bullet was the means of physical subjugation. Language was the mean of spiritual subjugation. Again, the bullet was the means of physical subjugation. So that's how the body was con controlled, right? They controlled the body with the bullet. But language, was the means of spiritual subjugation. So how the spirit was controlled, he's saying, is through language, okay? Let me illustrate this by drawing upon experiences in my own education, particularly in language and literature. So he lets you know there that going forward in the text, this is what he'll be doing. He'll be talking about his own experiences in the schooling system, dealing with language to talk about how his soul was subjugated through the um, force use and the coercion of the English language, okay? So um, I'm gonna put my, my piece on hold there. We'll open it up to Fishbowl. Uh, is there anybody who wants to volunteer for Fishbowl? Um, I will. Okay. Anybody else? All right, so I'll just um, call that random. Uh, Kayla, are you really, are you willing or ready to fishbowl? Mm, 
tend to pass. Mm -hmm. Um, Denise, are you willing or ready to fishbowl? Um, yeah, I can go today. Okay. Um, Kendra, are you willing to and ready to fishbowl today? Yes. Okay. All right. So that will be our three fishbowlers. Will be um, Galilee. Denise and Kendra, uh, whoever wants to set it off is on you. Um, okay, I'll start. So um, I think you just said this like right now as you ended the reading that the author was gonna start talking about like his experiences with um, fatalistic logic, I think. Um, and that kind of reminded me like growing up because I speak Spanish and English and so I grew up in like a primarily Spanish speaking household. So I remember starting um, kindergarten and like my professor, my teacher, sorry, um, saying that I was moving at like a slower pace, but I think it was just mainly because I was overstimulated with like a bunch of different uh, languages growing up, you know, like my grandparents spoke to me in Spanish, my parents talked to me in English, and then I got to school and it was kind of like a mix of the two. So yeah, that was just, that's just my experience that I related to. But um, I wanted to bring up how from what, what from I understood was that colonialism is like a large root of our problems even today, especially for people of color. And um, it seems that uh, a lot of the times uh, I see like mainly with non-people of color, they assume that we create our own problems when in reality, it's, it's more than that. There's like, there's a system in place that already is, I don't want to say preying on our downfall, but it really is. Um, and that's how I see it, especially from like, because I've experienced that like, personally. And um, uh, yeah, as I said, going back to like that, the whole, the system in place is already, it's like guarantee that um, people of color are like not going to really succeed. I mean, I know a lot of like low income areas um, are around me are primarily made up of like people of color. And unfortunately the truth is a lot of these kids end up like joining gangs or like selling drugs or just doing bad things, which I'm sure they don't, they wouldn't wanna do. But because of that, you know, eventually um, if they get in trouble with the law and if they somehow do come out, um, the system won't even allow them to go beyond that, you know, go past that which and it's just, it just creates like this vicious cycle for them. That's like never ending. And yeah, that's my take. Yeah, you, you said so much Galilee. Um, I, I'm gonna work what you just said first and then work my way back. Um, and really not only is it dependent on that they fail, right? They have mechanisms in play that where they profit off of the failure because we, we understand, right? That this prison system is a privatized system and people are making money off of the individuals who are being placed in jail, right? Um, also, when people are placed in these prisons, they have them do labor, right? Uh, Victoria's Secret gets manual labor off of prison labor. So this is the corporation that is benefiting off of this prison industrial complex, right? Um, I forget which airline company it is, but their seats are made inside of these prisons, right? So again, we have a major corporation that's literally benefiting off the individuals who are being placed Within, um, within the prison system. Um, another thing that you said kind of to start off your conversation was, you know, you, you live in a household where your grandparents spoke Spanish, um, your parents spoke English, and then, you know, you had to go to school and, and deal, with that, deal with that reality. Um, and, and it made me think, and they said that you learned slow, correct? As you said, they told you. Yeah, and, and what that made me think of was like, the cognitive process to think about something in Spanish or and then switching to the cognitive process to think about something in English. Does that make sense? Like you, you, you from I'm not bilingual, so I don't know, but what I hear is you literally think about things differently when it comes to thinking about things in Spanish and comes to thinking about things in English, which makes me think back to um, last week's reading, right? He says one of the difficulties he had in writing the book 
was there was no words in English to express the things that he experienced right, in the Dagara culture, right? And I would have to assume the same thing is at play within those who speak and think in Spanish and those who think and speak in English, right? And that's why in Googie says the spiritual subjugation took place with language, right? Because if I can control the way that you think and relate to yourself in the conversation that you have to yourself, right? Then I can control your spirit, right? So those are very good points. Thank you. Um, who's next? I'll go next. Um, so basically what I got from the reading was that culture bomb was like how like how people think of their culture and feel like their culture isn't valid. So they want to be like part of another culture. And something I found interesting in the book was that just because someone, a student wrote in English, like they were able to go to the meeting, but someone who's like a professional writer, just because their their novel wasn't written in English, they weren't able to attend. That's a good point, Kendra. Um, also, Think about this too, right? Um, when you are a writer, one of your main focuses is not only what you're trying to say, but who you're trying to say it to, right? Like your audience, okay? So this conversation around language is also a conversation around audience and this conversation around accessibility. Why would you guys think that I would say this conversation around language is a conversation around accessibility? Who has access to the to the book? Can you reword that? I'm yeah. sorry, I didn't understand. So, I said this conversation that Ngugi is having about language is also about access, right? So, what you're asking me to do is reword it in a way that you could understand it better, right? So that is also about access, right? Say it in a way that I have access to what you're saying, okay? So why is what language something is written in determines who would have access and who is the audience? Does that help you a little bit, Zara? Yeah, um, I was gonna use the, the example you just gave, like um, we always, as students or um, people, we always ask, if we could get um, we could get something explained to us in a different way, in a matter we will exp um, we will understand it. And when it comes to like the novel that he had written, um, he had written it in the language which his people would understand it. Not necessarily um, some could say the white folks um, they wouldn't understand what he was talking about, the culture he was talking about, while his own people would, unless. Um, unless it was explained to them in the matter of how he wanted to let them know who he was or what his culture was about. Yeah, absolutely. So in, in other words, right, the language determines the access, right? So I don't speak Spanish. So do I have an access to a book reading in Spanish? No, right? That forecloses my access, right? I don't have access to books written in Chinese because I don't speak Chinese. So what we're talking about also within this conference is because of English is being valued, right? We're valuing people who speak English, right? We value an English speaking audience, okay? So, um, right, either people who are the colonizers or the people who have been colonized, right? Are the only people who have access to this information. And this is what is part of Ngugi's tension, right? Why can't I create work that is accessible to my people? Um, thank you, Kendra. Uh, I think Denisha, the last one. Okay, so what I took from this reading was that I felt that the biggest worry of the problem regarding language was interpretation and what might get lost in it. And that kind of made me feel like it related to how generations work because we pass along messages to live by beliefs or even language and culture as we are exposed to society and we're considered the new and upcoming representation of all. So it kind of shares um, the worry of what will get lost in, in interpretation. 
that that is a a brilliant point, Denise. Um, also, so let's take what she just said in context of what we're doing in this class of what this what this class is, right? It's the African oral tradition, okay? Part of the larger conversation around the African oral tension is what Glissant talks about in the conflict between the oral and the written, right? So societies of mass or dominant culture will say African cultures are devalued because their history is oral, right? It's not written down. So they don't have the accounts to document their history and their folklore, right? Um, so what Denise is saying becomes very important because if the elders don't pass those oral traditions down, they don't continue. Or if they're not done in a manner that's efficient, they can continue to get lost in translation, right? And, and what she picks up is, and Googie's attentiveness to this also is, well, what, get, what happens when, if, if stories and histories get lost from generation to generation, what's gonna get lost when you switch to another language, right? Again, back to what um, Maladoma is saying, right? I couldn't write certain components of this book because English doesn't give me the tools to write it again. So that's something that's lost in translation. This is what Denise's point is, right? So this is a, this is a brilliant point. Also, um, part of this notion of the oral tradition is the, um, the role of the griot. Has anybody heard of the term griot? So in African societies, especially in, in, I mean, and they still exist today, but they were more prevalent in um, pre-colonial African societies. There was someone who was assigned the, the role of making sure that these stories get passed down, right? So think about who in your family like just knows all the family stories, right? I was gonna say dirt, but it, it may not be dirt, but you know what I'm saying? Just knows the family history, right? that would be considered the family griot, right? They're able to kind of pass down the story, typically like your grandmothers, your grand aunties, um, things of that nature, right? So there was an actual figure assigned. And again, you talk about purpose. Someone's purpose was this idea to be the griot, to make sure that these family traditions don't get lost with, in regards to what Denise is talking about, right? So pre-colonial African societies was concerned with the same thing and Googie and Denise is concerned with, so they assigned a role to make sure that that doesn't happen, right? But as colonialism begins to invade these societies and break up the way that they function, things and traditions get lost. Stories get lost, histories get lost, right? And it was done so effectively that I can't even trace back my lineage back across the Atlantic. Does that make sense to you? Do you understand what I'm saying when I say tracing my lineage back across the Atlantic, right? Um, I can only, as a, someone who is of African descent, right? Once I can trace my lineage all the way back to the first ancestor of mine who landed in this country, at that point it stops because there's no more record, right? So when you talk about colonialism's ability to erase things, this is how effective they are at that job, right? Um, how many people, and then we'll switch to the group conversation with this question. Two languages that we speak predominantly in this state are English and Spanish, right? Both of those languages are colonial languages. Why is that? Uh, well, at least for Spanish, what I'm thinking is um, like the Spaniards, they um, went and colonized the Mexican people and then they placed their Spanish. Cause I know like Spaniard Spanish is different than like what I speak as Mexican, as a Mexican, you know? Right. And like there's different words and different accents. Absolutely, absolutely, perfect. So that's why Spanish is a colonial language. Um, does anybody know the languages that indigenous people were speaking before Spanish? Is anybody familiar with that? Me neither, right? 
And again, that proves my point of how effective colonialism is at erasing things, right? Again, the vestiges of enslavement and colonialism are your name, your language, and your religion, right? We don't even know the indigenous languages that were speaking before Spanish, right? I don't even know the last name of my African ancestors. I can't even recover that information, right? Um, I have an inkling of some of the religious practices that took place before enslavement, but I don't know if the ethnic tribe that I'm from practiced that specific religion, right? So again, these are things that were erased that we are struggling to recover, right? No one could even answer what an indigenous language was. So I, I would dare to ask, what about some indigenous names prior to colonialization, right? Or religions, right? So when you talk about the ability to erase things, it's, it's profound the way that they're able to do that. Um, so for the time that we have left and for our group conversation, um, and, and, and Galilee touched on it a little bit in the sense of her being bilingual. I'm, I'm curious to hear how the other bilingual speakers in the class thought about this reading as it pertains to their dual languages. Um, and for the black folks in the class, I'm not letting y'all off the hook. Um, we're bilingual too, right? We could talk work talk and we could talk how I talk to your ass in the barbershop, right? So that's a form of bilingualism. Um, so I'm curious to see how you guys thought about the reading as it pertains to this notion of being bilingual. Um, yeah, so let's just start there. Um, preferably people who have not spoke a lot already, um, people who have not been in the fishbowl. I'm curious to hear your thoughts. We, it's like, oh, we can't hear you, man. It's like really low and muffled. Maybe if you get some headphones, that might work out a little bit better. Um, anybody else though? So Alex, what were your thoughts on the reading? Oh, no worries, Alex. Um, yeah, you can type it, man. I'm looking at what Ishaul says um, as knowing where and knowing where to speak English. And where. So I, I, what I'm interpreting from what Ishaul is saying, like there's places where speaking English is appropriate and then there's places where speaking Spanish is appropriate, right? So I would assume maybe growing up, they didn't want, and, and, and you know, Galilee spoke to this a little bit, right? In school, they didn't really want to hear you speak Spanish. It was more of an English speaking space. But at home, right, that may be more accepted and that's, that's okay, right? Um, over the past four years, right, the location, the spatial reality, the space where you can speak Spanish has been restricted, right? Um, you see a lot of the conversation around um, this is America, speak English or go back to your country, right? They're trying to restrict the space as to who can speak what language where, right? So, so I, I think this is what Ishaul is, is getting to. Um, anyone else have any comments, thoughts on the reading, uh, in particular those who are bilingual? Um, this notion, we also have this notion or idea of the cultural bond, right? Not being able to be proud of your own culture. Yeah, um, I was gonna share about that and specifically about the cultural bomb because, well, I myself, like um, I've witnessed and I've seen how like people that are from the same culture that I am, they're kind of embarrassed of their own culture where, you know, some people, even though they might know Spanish, they're kind of embarrassed to speak it or they kind I feel like they, um, like some people, they kind of try to adapt to the Western culture and kind of like, um, in a way, kind of like if they were um, like giving up their own culture to to take on this new cult Western culture that, you know, like 
what I mean is that they've been colonized, but in a way it, it's like to the point where they don't really accept their own culture and they don't really like want to be part of it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'd like to um, add on to that. Mm-hmm. Um, I think like based off the reading and also um, the cultural bomb, I think like I was able to like relate to that a lot because I know like when I go grocery shopping with my mom or something like she kind of gets embarrassed to speak Spanish not just not like because she's ashamed but she feels like people around her like down upon her because she can't speak English that well and I feel like that's why um us now like like the younger generations we uh don't speak a lot of Spanish because like it's kind of what our parents show us kind of like when they tell us like to talk to to others for them because you know they don't want to embarrass themselves yeah it's a very good point um sorry we'll go there um so cultural bomb comes up in a, a multitude of ways who is familiar with the term colorism okay um, Kaylin, you want to kind of explain colorism to, to us for those who aren't familiar? Well, um, just to, okay. Um, in certain, uh, cultures, not just black people, but other cultures, um, they treat lighter skinned people different than darker skinned people. And, um, <clears throat> that's because, you know, the lighter skin is more, uh, closer to European skins and stuff like that. And like the darker you are, the more like I don't know how to put this like native African foreign, yeah, right. So you're not e- you're not even treated like a human being. So you can see that, for example, in um, for black people, what they did was they separated um, lighter skinned people with dark, you know, from darker skinned people and. Um, the darker skinned people worked in fields and the lighter skinned people worked indoors and you probably um they probably were able to read or whatever while black people i mean darker skinned people didn't get that privilege and that was kind of to like that was kind of to um separate us and stuff like that so we just you know against each other in a way have y'all heard of the uh, paper bag test? No? Is that the test where um, they have like so many questions and it's it's likely for not, like they're giving it a certain time, right? And then they have to fill it out. And if they don't fill it out, then they're gonna be put into like a darker class or whatnot. That, that's that the one? like the um, voting, some of the voting things that you had to pass those, to pass those tests to be able to vote. But with the paper bag test would be like, they'll hold up a paper bag and it'll be whether your skin is lighter or darker than that paper bag will determine some of your social mobility, right? So for example, me and Kaylin, Kaylin would be closer to that paper bag. So she would have more social ability, right? Whereas me, I would be considered darker. So that would limit my social ability, right? So when you talk about this idea of the cultural bomb, this is how this begins to play out. Um, In the Caribbean and in Africa, particularly West Africa today, right? In 2021, um, there's a phenomenon of skin bleaching. Um, have y'all seen Sammy Sosa? No, y'all, yeah, man. When you get a chance, go home, or you're already, already at home, go on your internet, look up Sammy Sosa. Get before and after pictures of Sammy Sosa, right? He looks like a, a weird ass vampire ghoulish looking character. But this is due to this phenomenon of skin bleaching, right? the cultural bomb that identifies lighter skin with being more desirable and being more um, beautiful than darker skin, okay? Um, There's a professor out of Harvard who has a PBS series. Um, His name is Henry Louis Gates. Um, In the series, he talks about the African presence in Central and South America, right? So the African presence in Mexico, the African presence all throughout South America. And there's this episode, and I I don't remember, but it's something about the Negro abuela in the closet, right? So the black grandma in the closet, right? And they're saying how in all of these indigenous families, if you trace their family history far enough, somebody y'all got, one of y'all got a black auntie, right? And this is just through how the process of 
what Galilee says, right? The Spaniards came in and forced their language upon the Mexican people, right? There's people in Mexico who are, who are dark ass or darker than me, right? Historically, right? There's people all throughout South America who are as dark ass or darker than me. Um, Dominican Republic has a very large phenomenon of this, right? Again, dark ass or darker than me. Dominican Republic and Haiti is one island. I'm gonna say that again. Haiti and the Dominican Republic is one island. It's separated by a false border, okay? Um, the people in Haiti are considered more closer to be African. The people in the Dominican Republic, they consider themselves Spanish. They're the same people on the same island. The only thing is colonialism drew the line and separated the, the areas, right? Again, this is the effect of the cultural bomb, right? I don't wanna identify with a group of people because those group of people are identified with being African, right? So these are how these things play out in real time. And again, I don't wanna underemphasize the point that this notion of colorism is only a phenomenon within the black community, right? Um, within again, the indigenous community, only the lighter skinned women get to make the novellas, right? Um, in the Asian communities, only the lighter skinned women get to make their movies. Right, it, it, this is something that is, is global, right? It's a global phenomenon. But here's the twist, here's where it gets funny. European people spend a lot of their time doing what for their skin? Tanning, right? While certain people are bleaching their skin to look lighter, European people sit under electric, electricity to get darker, right? Hollywood has a great phenomenon of doing what? Shooting lip injections, right? To look like the people who they make fun of for having big lips, right? They make fun of black women for having big butts and they turn around and shoot collagen in their butts to have big butts, right? So this is just the insanity of these ideas of cultural bombs, right? This, the insanity of what they produce. And the fact that the cultural bombs not only affect the culture that's dominated, right, the colonized beings, but the cultural bombs also affect the dominated. And that's why you have these weird type of phenomenons to while they're telling you dark skin is ugly, they're going to get tanning, right? Does that make sense? Um, other thoughts, other comments, other questions, other concerns? So looking at the chat, um, Alex is saying how the um, cultural bomb caused the effect of lose, a loss of identity. Absolutely, right? And this formed in the, the form of language in this context. Yeah, could you um, express that a little bit more, Kaylin? Um, just from my personal experience, um, when I talk to certain people, um, I don't usually speak the correct English or whatever. But when I um, sometimes when I speak, people uh, correct me about how I'm speaking and whatnot. And it's kind of like I'm speaking correctly because you understand exactly what I'm saying. <laughs> so it's kind of I'm communicating. I can you can understand exactly what I'm saying and what I'm trying to get across and what people don't understand is um, when African people came to this country and even any other country, um, they were robbed from their own uh, language. So we had, to, we had to do something. We had to make something of ourselves and keep some of the identity with us. So we created things like Ebonics to kind of um, speak, so we can speak English, but in our own style. Yeah. So when they try to kind of correct us, it's kind of like they're trying to eliminate us all together, yeah. is what I'm trying to say. No, it's a great point. And also, like I would liken it, right, to what Galilee is saying. So there's the Spanish that's spoken in Spain, 
and then there's a Spanish that's spoken in Mexico, right? There's a different dialect to the way that those vernacular expressions are, are, are manifested, right? Same thing. So there's a way that white folks speak English, and then there's a way that black folks speak English, right? That's, it's a form of dialect. So even to put an academic twist on this, right? So there's a professor, um, sorry, there's an academic by the name of John Ogbu. He's out of, he's a Nigerian born intellectual, but he studied in the United States. And in the night, in like 1995, in the mid 90s, he does this research in Oakland, right? So y'all should, I'm sure y'all familiar with the Oakland area. Um, and what he studied was this movement to make Ebonics as a recognized second language. Now, um, y'all probably too young, but like I remember in the mid 90s, this was a national conversation, right? Um, the United States was discussing, should we make Ebonics like a recognized second language? So where I would literally be able to put bilingual on job applications because I spoke Ebonics, right? I mean, from Jesse Jackson to like all the black leaders took up this conversation around Ebonics, right? And so John Ogbu does this whole study of this school in Oakland that allowed it to be used as an official language and, and how this affected the students um, academic participation. Um, I'm not going to go into the research for sake of time, but what is fascinating is if you look at people who are from the Oakland area and if you hear them talk, has anybody is anybody familiar with Oakland? Everybody anybody been to Oakland? I'm from Oakland. You're, okay, so you, okay, bet. So you, so there's a there's a specific way that people in Oakland talk. Like you would know somebody's from LA, and you would know somebody's from Oakland just by their dialect. It's 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 distinct. It's indistinguishable, right? Um, but people in from Oakland have a tendency to maintain that vernacular. Um, for those who are familiar with football, I'll give you Marshawn Lynch, right? No matter what platform that he's on, he talks the same way regardless, he's consistent. Um, for those who are in like entertainment, anybody seen the Black Panther movie? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. So the director of that movie is um, Ryan Coogler. He's from Oakland, right? He talks like he's from Oakland. There's no code switching. So I, I do this, I bring this up to draw this tie of individuals who were academically allowed to express themselves in their native language and their pride that they have in that to where even when they get in professional circles, they don't switch it up. They maintain their vernacular. Um, for me, I do that as a part of my, my teaching method, right? That's why I don't, I mean, I could talk to you guys all theoretical, like I, I could talk to you guys how I write if I'm in an academic space, if I so choose to, right? But again, this goes back to the question of access. If I come talking about the dialectical, the material theories of Marxists, and you wouldn't know what the fuck I'm talking about, right? But I have to talk to you in a way that you understand, right? To provide access. Um, also, for, my, for me, I didn't have a black teacher until um, I got to college, right? So one, you don't see yourself in your educational experience. And then, so if somebody doesn't look like you, right? But then when you finally get to somebody that does look like you and they don't talk like you, right? That's another level of, of dissonance, dis dissonance, right? It's a level of separation. You can't identify with them. So for me purposely, I talk the way that I talk outside of the classroom, in the classroom, right? Um, when I'm in my PhD classes, I don't talk any different how I talk to y'all, how I talk to my homeboy on the street, right? Um, and that's a purposeful thing, right? Because I want to have um, pride in this dialect, this vernacular that they want to call urban, that they want to call ebonics, that they want to call um, uneducated, right? But to me, I flip that notion on, on its head because how are you going to tell me I'm an educator? I have a PhD, right? And I can talk all the shit I want to because I have the credentials to, to back it up, right? So these are things to contemplate as you guys continue on your academic experience, right? Um, when you show up, if you do choose to go to grad school, how are you going to show up, right? Are you going to take your abuela with you into the classroom, right? Are you going to be embarrassed of the things that she taught you, right? Are you going to take your talesmen into the classroom with you and use your cultural knowledge to help you navigate your college experience? Or are you going to be ashamed of those things, right? The things that very well may help you be successful, right? 
These are things to contemplate as you continue on. And not only college, right, but as you show up in the world, when you go to work, how, you, how are you gonna go to work, right? Do you contort your voice to sound all nasally so you can sound professional or you just be yourself, right? These are um, ethical questions that as you become adults that you're gonna have to ask yourself, right? Thoughts, questions, concerns, comments. Y'all okay? Y'all sleep? It's the rain, huh? It's the weather and the clouds and shit. Got y'all. Sorry. But I still need one more thought and we'll call it a day. For me, I feel like it's not necessarily that I'm like asleep or whatever, but it's like, I don't know. I feel like we talked about so many things that I'm kind of just like, not dumbfounded, but I'm just like, I don't know, just like thinking about everything. And I'm like, that's so true. And at the same time, how I can't even relate to some of the things personally. Like I know, for example, I've had teachers that were Mexican teachers, but they would speak I don't know, they would like, well, obviously they speak English and they would do it in a way where it's kind of like, in a way I kind of felt less about myself. I'm like, I don't know, like, sh like, should I sound more like them or like just be me, you know, like, I don't know, it's kind of crazy. Yeah, um, there's a professor at Cal State LA in the education department and he does um, graduate studies, so like master's work. His name is Carlos Tejeda and it was like the dopest shit I've ever experienced in my life. Like he would say these big ass philosophy words and these big philosophical theories, but he would sound like the homeboy in East LA. Like it, it, it just sound like your average essay. Like, but to me, it was poetic. It, it, was, it was poetry, man, because he didn't, you couldn't challenge him on what he knew. You couldn't challenge his intellect because you heard it in what he was saying, but the way he said it, was just in a way that everyone felt comfortable. Everyone felt welcome to be themselves. And, and, and it does drastically impact your education. Alert experience. from calendar. My fault. FW, spring semester, all college meeting. Anyway, I got all my business on camera, but anyway. Um, yeah, so those things make a difference, right? Like in the way that you can see yourself. And again, this question and this notion of accessibility, right? The way you see yourself in spaces allows those spaces to become accessible. Um, let me just put, show you guys what the reading for next week is and we'll call it a day. Bear with me one second. So next week's reading will be Hurston, Mules and Men. It's seven pages, um, but what I will say is going to sound a little different. So we had a conversation about Ebonics. Um, this whole seven pages is written in Ebonics. Um, it, it, it's like, like the old, so essentially what it was is she goes down to Florida in like the 1930s, right? And she records these documents of folklore. Um, so the way that they talk is not only super Southern, um, but it's, old Southern, right? So I would advise you to read it slow, read it out loud, because sometimes hearing it is going to allow it to make sense than trying to read it, okay? Um, so kind of give your time, give yourself time to deal with that as it pertains to um, you going through the reading. Um, it's not a lot and the material is not hard. Once you kind of get the rhythm of like that dialect, since I mean, I think we had a very appropriate conversation around dialect leading to this reading. Once you get the rhythm of the dialect, it'll make more sense. But again, I suggest reading it out loud. It'll help it a little bit um, and, and reading it slow. Um, it's an auditory thing, right? It's not, you gotta got hear what's being said more so than looking at it. So reading it to yourself will not really serve you as best as it would reading it out loud. Um, other than that, if you have any 